that's not a nice little slidey glidey fade out. I don't know what it is. 184 shows later, we got her. <laughs> <laughs> finally, finally. Yeah, finally. <laughs> okay, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach for June the 25th. Wow. Astronomy Show. Wow. Where's the month? Where's the year going? We're still halfway guys. through already. Yes, for sure. Uh, my name is Chris Kerr, and I'm your host this evening and uh, creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer as well, and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce our two regular co-hosts for the program, uh, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton. Paul, good evening. Hello, hello. Hey. And our other regular co-host here on the program, Mr. Mike Powell from the Peel Hill Observatory in beautiful St. John. Mike, good evening. Hey. Hey. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, these last few episodes have been dedicated to learning how to get uh, the most enjoyment out of our summer skies. Uh, we've talked a little bit about prominent summer constellations, um, how to capture amazing images of star trails, uh, and even some of the best binocular targets to enjoy. Well, this week, uh, on our final week before summer break, we'll take a look at some stargazing tips to help you make the most out of those clear nights and uh, some of the, the best celestial and outreach events that you can look forward to over the next uh, few months. Also on tonight's show, uh, Mike will be bringing uh, back Bino Bud for another fun binocular target of the week. Paul will provide us with another interesting Rosanna's fun fact. Uh, and my uh, what's up talk for the week is really when you look out, just look out the window. It's cloud all week. So. <laughs> if, it, if it clears up, we'll do a what's up talk on my page sometime through the week. But I don't know. I'm not going to tell you you're going to see this and that because you're not going to see none of it. You know, you could learn to be a meteorologist and you could tell them what's up about the clouds and what they're made out of and all that stuff. And we were discussing that before the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get and Sean we'll, on here. <laughs> He'll tell us all about the, this guy. Uh, we're also going to have all of your wonderful photo submissions to share as well tonight. So this is the family-friendly interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, we're happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions in real time as well. So we'd like to we'd like to get your feedback uh, since we're going to be taking a break here. This is our final program until sometime mid-September. Let us know what you think of the show. Um, uh, some thoughts, maybe uh, even some ideas if you think that we should be pursuing when we come back again in September. But uh, let us know how you've enjoyed the broadcast so far. That would be great. I'd like to see them in your comments. Uh, and also, of course, uh, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support, Rogers. So I guess let's get started, guys, with tonight's program. And a look at some useful stargazing tips, along with those special celestial events coming soon. So that's going to be me tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I think I'm going to try to share the, uh, which one's going to be? Maybe number four, I guess. Four here, and I'm going to go from here to this one. I'm going to go from here to this one. And that should bring it up. Are we seeing? Uh... Yeah, it looks good. Okay, yes. Hello? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. No. okay. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's get started with some summer stargazing tips and some events. Um, well, first of all, let's get started with some stargazing itself. Okay, what is stargazing? Well, stargazing, first of all, is uh, easy. You just have to look up. Like getting started can be a daunting for some, for sure. Now, there is a misconception that if you want to get into stargazing and see anything in the night sky, you have to spend money on high-tech equipment, such as go-to telescopes and CCD cameras. What if you just want to uh, start with very basic astronomy, though, and you don't want to buy anything? Uh, what can you see just by stepping outside and looking up? Well, there are a number of steps that you can do. Uh, I'm going to try to cover a few of the tips and tricks here tonight to enjoy a little bit of a night under the stars. One of the first things you want to consider is where you should be observing from. Uh, some are lucky enough to observe right from their own backyard, like Paul there. Uh, but if you're surrounded by tall buildings or if you have to deal with a lot of light pollution, you may want to pick out a different location. 
Now, Google Maps can be a great resource. From aerial views, you can choose a location that is dark yet safe and hopefully not too far from home. And another handy reference is the light pollution map, similar to the one that's provided on the website, cleardarksky.com. Uh, so you can go there to find out what uh, type of light pollution you're going to have to experience. Uh, dress for the occasion. That's another big step. Uh, when the sun goes down, it can get really chilly, no matter what time of year. And add to that the joy of mosquitoes, and your evening out can become unpleasant very quick. And now the general rule of thumb for stargazers is to bring along enough clothing to keep you warm if it was 10 degrees colder than it really is. Uh, when you are stargazing, you spend a lot of time, uh, long periods of time, standing or st just sitting still. And since you're not moving around much, uh, you don't generate a whole lot of heat. Something else to consider is warm footwear and uh, waterproof if, if you can. Um, grass can get very wet very quickly with the evening dew. So try to get sneakers that, uh, that aren't, uh, it was a fabric type. And throw on some mosquito repellent as well, in your, or throw it into your carrier bag for sure. And once you're there and you've got all that ready to go, well, the next thing you want to do is let your eyes dark adapt a bit. Um, once you arrive at your site, your eyes will need to dark adapt. Now, this process can take at least a half hour and involve your pupils dilating to allow for reduced light levels. Once they do, you won't believe how many more stars are visible. Uh, do avoid looking at your phone uh, or in the direction of any bright lights. Instead use a, uh, of using a phone app, try to uh, use a printable star chart, which are available online in lots of places and bring along a red flashlight for viewing them. This will help uh, aid uh, you to keep your dark adaptation. Now, comfort is key. Uh, there are more ways to be sure you're focused in the night sky and not in your own discomfort. Warm clothes are essential, as I mentioned, uh, including socks and footwear that stays dry. You could be standing on grass or whatever for quite a while. You should also consider bringing along a comfortable chair. A stargazing can be tough on the neck. A uh, warm thermos, because you're looking up, of course. <laughs> a warm thermos of your favorite beverage uh, helps to uh, take away the chill as well. And if you have an extra one, bring along a blanket. Just, just in case. Grabbing a photo for a memory. Well, most of us carry a pretty decent camera with us on our phones, and many own a DSLR setup. Uh, it is fun to capture memory to share later. Experiment with, with settings and always try to use a tripod if possible. Now, do I need a telescope? Uh, no, you don't need a telescope to enjoy the wonders of the night sky. Binoculars work great for beginners and advanced astronomers too. They do uh, give you the correct view. They are portable and they are lightweight and they are reasonably inexpensive. Enjoy binoculars before you ever invest in a telescope. I think we've all learned that one. What kind of things can you see with binoculars? Well, they're double the multiple star systems. Some stars are not alone. In fact, about five to 10% of all the stars we see are actually double stars. And there are many more cases where we know the second star is there, but we just can't see it from Earth. Now, along with this, there are large numbers of multiple star systems, like uh, the ones in the heads of Gemini, the twins, Castor, and uh, uh, a sextuplet star system. And uh, there are a large number of striking double stars, too, such as Alberio and Cygnus, this one here. Very pretty uh, grouping. Always a very popular summer target, for sure. Uh, open star clusters. <clears throat> That's another good one for binoculars. Now, there are also clusters that are not as tightly bound by gravity. We call them open clusters. Uh, here are two that you can see naked eye tonight, the double cluster. Well, maybe not tonight, but any night. That's clear. Uh, the double cluster. They lie at a distance of about 7,500 light years away in the Perseus arm of the Milky Way galaxy. So these are beautiful uh, double clusters of stars, two clusters of stars there, easily visible, uh, naked eye from a dark sky sight. And they look perfect in binoculars. And of course, the Milky Way. Glancing back at our, own, at our place in the Milky Way can be a very enjoyable experience. A simple view with binoculars can reveal so much, thousands of stars of many different colors and brightness. And wonderful star clusters like the large and small Sagittarius star cloud, which would be down in this area. Um, of this, there's Sagittarius sitting here, so right in this part of the area here. Beautiful uh, clusters of stars right in here. Excuse me. A lot of people don't, uh, when you take a pair of binoculars and show somebody what the night sky is like looking into uh, that section of the Milky Way, they're amazed really by the amount of stars that they didn't believe were there. So it's quite a nice view.
Of course, uh, if you're looking for interesting binocular targets, uh, remember that you can always review Mike's top binocular treasures on any previous episode of our program, uh, his uh, Bino Bud episodes. All of our previous episodes are up on my YouTube channel, so you can find them all there. Learning the constellations and asterisms. Uh, constellations are our roadmaps to the night sky. We break the sky up into pieces, and then we look inside those pieces for the treasures. It may seem overwhelming at first, but by taking a small section at a time over many nights, you will become comfortable on where to look and what you're looking at. And later, as you step up to optical equipment, the knowledge you pick up by getting familiar with the constellations will become invaluable and provide you with the confidence when trying to find objects or sharing those views with others. So get out there and learn the constellations. Constellations can also act as signposts. Uh, using constellations as signposts to the night sky can be very helpful. Seen here, the constellation of Ursa Major makes an excellent signpost, mapping out the path to many other constellations. So the two last stars of the, of the pot, of the, the Big Dipper, I'll call it, head on to Polaris and straight on through to Pegasus. We follow the three stars of the handle backwards. We go down to Arc to Arcturus, and we spike it down to Spica and Virgo. So it's that type of thing. Um, this is a nice little drawing uh, to get you through and a uh, nice one to print off actually too, if you're outside. Everybody can find the Big Dipper pretty easily. Can you find the rest of these constellations as well? Uh, so take a, a snapshot of that, maybe print it off and uh, take it outside and see what you can find. It's a great start to learn uh, where the constellations are. Observing meteor showers. Well, that's something we can all do. Uh, meteor showers are those special events that everyone can enjoy. We have several each year and some with very favorable conditions this year, like the Perseids uh, this year. All you need is a comfortable spot to view and some patience. Always uh, best to share with a friend or family member with each of you starting at a portion of the, or staring at a portion of the sky and then shouting out meteor when you see one. Uh, no experience or equipment necessary for that. And then, of course, there's solar observing. Uh, astronomy doesn't have to be just a nighttime activity. Our star is, always puts on a great uh, show, as long as you have properly filtered equipment. Our sun goes through an 11-year cycle. Right now, the, our sun is ramping up to solar maximum, which means more activity, more sunspots, more solar flares, and more chances for viewing the northern lights. Uh, we can view our sun through, types, through two types of telescopes or filters, uh, a white light filter, which helps us observe sunspots, and an H-alpha filter, which helps us observe the sun's surface in large loops of plasma called prominences. This is what can be revealed in our daytime setup. Now, the image on the left is the one in, quote, white light, uh, which reveals the sunspots, and the image on the, on the right is an H-alpha, which we can see a lot more of the prominences and things around the edges. What else? Well, there's, of course, there's all kinds of uh, free software out there and apps today that'll help you learn the night sky. One of the best, I, I think, anyway, and the most powerful is this one known as Stellarium. It can provide you with views of the night sky from any place on Earth and on any day, giving you lots of chances to re research what's up if you plan on going out observing over the next few nights or whatever. And there are some excellent tutorials uh, online with Stellarium as well to help you. So a few final thoughts. So stargazing can be a rewarding and humbling experience. It is one of those hobbies that can be equally enjoyed um, by alone or with a group, and it requires no experience or equipment to get started. Learn the constellations and asterisms. Decide whether being outside at night for hours at a time is really for you before you invest in expensive equipment. Bring along accessories to keep you comfortable. Take a few photos for keepsakes. Share the night sky with your friends and family and get them involved in stargazing nights as well. Learning together can make it more enjoyable. Also, seek out your local astronomy club in your area. Most clubs have regular outreach events and most clubs offer telescopes to borrow free of charge. It can really be a satisfying hobby and the treasures of the night sky are there every clear night waiting for you all for free. So there's not too much in life that's free. All right, so let's take a look at a few, uh, I just gathered a few celestial and special outreach events that are coming up uh, over the next couple of months or so. I'm going to start with the fact that we have four supermoons on their way uh, in 2023, July 3rd, August the 1st, August 30th, which is a supermoon and a blue moon, and September 29th. 
Now, a supermoon occurs when the moon's orbit is at its closest or perigee to Earth at the same time that the moon is full. Supermoons are typically about 14% bigger and about 30% brighter than a micromoon, which is the farthest moon away from us. Now, when I go out and see a moon rise like this, this is one over Canaport, basically. Um, I can't tell if that's a micromoon or, or a supermoon. Like, I, I couldn't remember how big the moon was last month, let alone, you know, but I remember exactly where it was last month. It was, is it as big as it was last month or smaller? Doesn't really matter. When the moon's close to the horizon, we get involved in that thing called the moon illusion, uh, which is our brains playing a trick on us that the moon is actually bigger than it than it really is. So it's more, I think, of the moon illusion than it is actually the fact that it's called this, quote, supermoon. But supermoon sounds good in the media. You know, it drags the media into it and they they pub, you know publish it out there and it gets everybody excited. So whatever. If that gets people excited, I'm happy with it. So, so as far as... Uh, Events go, well, July 1st, we have the conjunction of Venus and Mars. On July 1st, Venus and Mars will be in conjunction, placing them only about three and a half degrees apart in our evening sky. That means they're going to fit together in the field of view of uh, 10 by 50 binoculars, usually. The two worlds will be close for the week or so before and after conjunction as well. Now, in astronomy, a conjunction occurs when any two astronomical objects, such as asteroids, moons, planets, and stars, appear to be close together in the sky as observed from Earth. Uh, so Mars is getting very difficult to pick out. I know uh, in a lot of, uh, even looking at it from St. Sarah's speech uh, last week there, it was a little tough to pick it out. But using Venus as a guide now over the next uh, few weeks, you might be able to get a, a better opportunity to see where it is. Uh, on July 3rd, we have a supermoon, first supermoon of the year arrives on the evening of July 3rd. Now the moon turns full at 838 uh, AM that day, when it will be about 360,600 kilometers from Earth near its perigee, or its closest approach. The moon will rise in the southeast at 10.09 PM that evening. A fairly late uh, moon rise, but it's still talking July 3rd, so we're still going to have a, a nice uh, view of it. On August the 1st, their second supermoon uh, of the year. On that day, our moon turns full at 3.31 PM Atlantic time. And it rises uh, in the east southeast at 9.25 p.m. On August the 10th, Mercury is at its greatest eastern elongation. Um, it, and that means uh, the point at which it appears the farthest east that it can in our evening sky. This is the one of the best times to try and spot that elusive uh, planet. It is a tough, tough one to get, but uh, it is possible. <clears throat> on August 11th and 12th, the Perseid meteor shower. Hey, we've got, a, we've got a good show coming up this year, I think, uh, as long as we get the, the, the right weather. The Perseid meteor shower, the most famous of all meteor showers, is expected to reach its peak during the pre-dawn hours of August 12th. On that evening, the moon will be at a favorable 21% illumination, making it easier for us to spot those fainter meteors. Now, this is a waning crescent moon, so it'll be up uh, late evening, but after 1, 1 a.m., I guess. The Perseids can produce a zenith hourly rate of up to 100 meters per hour on a good night. So look forward to that one. Nice warm conditions, August 11th, 12th. Great time to be out. Great thing to be observing the meteor shower. Uh, share it with family and friends. It's a great event. On August 27th, Saturn is actually at opposition. Uh, Saturn reaches opposition on August 27th this year. This is the time when Earth is placed between the Bring Beauty and our Sun. It also leads to our best views of Saturn when it's at its closest approach to us all year. And uh, opposition, Saturn rises as the sun sets, and it sets as the sun rises, so it's visible all night long. That's your best viewing of Saturn right around the time of opposition. And the rings of Saturn now are kind of closing up. Um, they're, they're open uh, this year, but not wide open, um, and they're closing up over the next couple of years to the point where it'll just be uh, basically a line. You won't be able to see much of the rings at all. And then they'll start to open up the other way again. On August the 30th, we have our another supermoon. And this one's the blue moon because we had a full moon on August 1st. And this is the second uh, full moon of the month. So we call it a blue moon. Um, <clears throat> this one's also a blue moon, which is defined as the second full moon of the month. Moonrise on this night will be at 8.20 p.m. in the east to southeast. The moon turns full at 10.35 p.m. Atlantic time. 
On the September 22nd, we have Mercury again at its greatest western elongation. So September 22nd, Mercury will be at its greatest western elongation or the farthest western point that it can reach in our morning sky. At this time of year, the ecliptic, uh, the path that the sun, the moon, and the planets seems to take across the sky, it, make, it makes a very steep angle with respect to the horizon, making Mercury an easier target. It also is uh, different for... Uh, for our uh, moon rise. Um, if it, the ecliptic is shallow, uh, the moon rise will stay in this part of the sky a longer period of time near the horizon. So it'll appear that orangey kind of a color a longer period of time. On September 29th, our last super moon of the year. Um, on that evening, the moon will turn full at 657 Atlantic time, shortly before rising in the east at 725. So a few events to talk about. Um, we've got a list now of the events that are going to be happening at the Irving Nature Park. These are all scheduled events now. Um, so I wanted to put these out here tonight and I'll be posting them on my page as well tonight, later on. Uh, so August the 11th, we have from 9, 30, 9 to 11.30 is a Percy meteor shower with a backup date of August 12th. So we're going to be inside the park, right up there at that second uh, level where the parking lot is, the second park in the upper parking lot, I'll call it, uh, on the evening of the Percy meteor shower. So that's from 9 to 11.30. So you might get a chance to see some nice Perseids in there in the park where it's dark on that particular evening. So we'll look forward to that one. On September 22nd, from 8 to 11.30, we'll have Fall Astronomy Day with a backup uh, date of September 23rd. Uh, October 14th, from 1.30 to 3.30, we have the Partial Eclipse of the Sun. And that's going to be about 10% eclipsed uh, here around New Brunswick. I think it's 10 to 12% roughly. Um, of course, our biggest eclipse is going to be next year on April the 8th, but this is the lead into it. Uh, if, if you're farther south, uh, say uh, in Valdi, Texas, you get the full eclipse. And then on October 21st, uh, from 7 to 10 p.m., we have the International Observe the Moon Night with a backup date of October 22nd. So that's the four events that we have planned at the moment uh, for the Urban Nature Park this year. <clears throat> and from there, I'll go to our RASC Star Party events. So we've got Three more star parties uh, that are coming up this year. Now, a star party is uh, is an event where astronomers from all around the province will gather together in a particular park uh, to help support their dark sky initiatives. And uh, we'll be looking at Mount Carleton on August the 18th and 19th. Uh, Fundy Stargaze from on September 8th and 9th. Now, we would normally have that on the Labor Day weekend, but this year the Labor Day weekend falls on the full moon. And of course, we don't want a big moon in the sky on the night of stargazing because it just interferes with everything. It just washes out everything else. So we're trying to stay away from that. And then we have the Kujipagat Fall Star Fest, September 22nd, 23rd. So what happens with these events is that you book yourself a campsite in any one of these parks. Uh, we arrive and we set up all of our equipment and you're usually in the big field. Um, and you were invited in to uh, share the night sky with us uh, over two evenings, all free of charge. Our part is free of charge. You need to pay for your park pass. So you can either pay for a park pass, come in for the evening, or you can pay for camping uh, over the couple of nights. And we are there for two full nights. So we arrive, uh, some we set up usually right around uh, dusk uh, on both evenings. So August 18th will be right around nine o'clock or so. And then we'll go to, uh, you know, usually midnight or so. And then uh, we'll usually stay up till, till quite late after that. It's, it's the thing that we do, so. <clears throat> but the uh, star uh, party events are always fun. Um, you've got lots of telescopes. You've got lots of amateur astronomers there. If you're thinking about buying a telescope, you can talk to the astronomers. They love talking about their year. And uh, you can decide, you know, hey, is this the right scope for me? Uh, I want to invest 500 bucks or 1000 bucks. What should I be buying? That kind of thing. So you can take a look through the eyepiece of these telescopes and decide you know, what might be right for you. Uh, just ask the astronomers. That's what they're there for. So, so those are events coming up. Uh, in uh, August to September. <clears throat> and of course, you can always go back and refer to our calendar. Uh, this is the St. John Astronomy Club RASC and B calendar uh, for June, July. Kirk puts, uh, Nathan puts this out, uh, and this is going to be due up on July 15th. So all the events that are happening between now and July 15th are listed here on the calendar. And you can download it for free at uh, sjastronomy.ca. And Lisa's Lookup, uh, there's the other source of information for you. If you go to uh, Lisa's Lookup uh, page, you can find her at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. So she lists the dates of the events, the peak time of the event, uh, 
translated uh, the Eastern time. And then your seeing tools, naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So you can find her again at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. And that's about all we're going to say about the special events coming up and how to do some stargazing. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> all righty. That was good. Well, cover some stuff. Lots of stuff. All right, let's go from there then to uh, let's go from there then to a uh, vinyl bud. How's that next? No, we're not going to do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <Let's> move on. <laughs> we decided, no, nah, we're not going to do it <laughs> because we can't share the screen at the moment. Oh, we can't share the screen. Oh, <laughs> my fault. Now you can. What's your excuse now? There we go. There you go. We should have our friend showing up on our screen here. So binocular target of the week this week by Buy No Bud is dun, 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 M13. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> <laughs> so what is M13? Let's say 13 also designated NGC 6205 is sometimes called the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules or the Great Hercules Cluster. It's a globular cluster of several hundred thousand stars in the constellation of Hercules. Although only telescopes with great light gathering capability can fully resolve the stars of the cluster, M13 may be visible to the naked eye depending on the circumstances, and it's very visible in a pair of binoculars. So how do I find it in the sky? Well, if it was a clear night and you waited till 11 o'clock, now that it's starting to get dark late at night, and you oriented yourself due south at 180 degrees to look virtually straight up, you'll find that center keystone that makes up the, the body of Hercules. And in that keystone, on uh, the two sides that are farthest away from the Milky Way, you come down about oh, one third of the way and M13 is right in there. So a little closer look again, you look at the, the or the longest side, I guess, if, if, uh, if it works better for you that way. You got two stars on the longest side of that uh, center trapezium, and you will find M13 about oh, one third of the way between the two or two thirds of the way, depending on which end you go by. Once you get on it, you'll know it. What will you see? Well, this is a nice shot through a telescope of it. And I mean, there is a lot of stars in that globular cluster. So you'll notice the two bright stars on either side, and then the globular cluster in the center. We often call it the cotton ball. When you see that cotton ball, you'll know you're on M13. 10 by 50 binoculars, it's not a large target, but it's big enough and easy enough to see. If you compare it to the full moon, well, between the width of those two bright stars is about the width of the full moon. And then the globular cluster will sit in the center. So it is a nice target. You will notice it. It'll pop right out at you when you get it. And it's a fun target to look for with a pair of binoculars. And there is our laser pointer <laughs> perils. <laughs> One easy night at the beach. <laughs> That's binocular target of the week by Bud. No Bud. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. Um, Paul, you want to show a few photos maybe first, did you? Okay, you can do that. Okay. I'm going to put this other one off here. Hang on. There we go. Okay. I'm just going to get this open first. Uh, I've got first picture open and then I'll share my screen. Okay, <clears throat> before I share the screen, all I want to show tonight was uh, we had a talk on star trails uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, in, the, in preparation, the reason I, I had done that, of course, I want to show it to, to this audience. But at the same time, I wanted to prepare uh, a talk for a photography group because they wanted to uh, hear about how you take pictures of, of the night sky. So, um, so it was uh, star trails first. So I said, if you're going to start doing astrophotography, get out there with a camera and a telescope or a tripod under the sky, and then uh, and then we'll do star trails first. And that's kind of a segue into it. And if that's all you want to do with star trails after that, then at least you've got that. If you want to work into the Milky Way, well, you've got that. And then if you get the bug, then we can talk about telescopes. <laughs> but until then. This is a real simple thing to do. So, um, so we uh, we did the talk. The talk went well. People got enthusiastic about it. So we decided to have an outing, and we were going to take everybody out, and we were going to go take pictures of star trails, and we did. 
And uh, where we went was the same place that the three of us went to get the Aurora, which was uh, Florida Beach. But instead of setting up where we set up to get the Aurora, we went all the way around to the beach down the other end, which gives us the longer look and a better view of uh, a more open view and, the, and a northern facing uh, view so that we could get star trails. So I just want to show just a few pictures of, uh, of how that turned out. And the reason I'm doing this isn't to show you about the event that we had, but how easy it was for people that really know nothing about astrophotography, but want to get out and shoot these star trails based on the same exact techniques that we have on the, on the YouTube channel here that you can go back to and look up if you want to. So I'll share my, my page and or my screen rather, and uh, show you what went on. So, um, so this is uh, a few of us setting up. Now, there's, there's this many people, again, on the other side of me. When you're shooting something like this, obviously, you don't want people walking in front of your camera. So <laughs> you kind of got to spread out. So this was us kind of setting up, uh, getting ready for it. The sun was going down, and uh, everybody was getting enthused. And this was the time they said, OK, what settings do we use? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we covered all of that. OK, these are the settings. And then everybody there except me had a Nikon camera <laughs> and they had an intervalometer built into their Nikon camera and uh, and I didn't know how to set it up, of course, because I'm not an Nikon guy. But anyway, after about, a I don't know, 40 minutes of struggling with it, we figured out how to get it up and running. So we were able to get everybody ready to take some uh, photographs. So as we start getting dark, uh, you can see uh, Venus in the background in the back corner and of course the moon was just up so it was getting dark everybody was just waiting for it to get dark enough so that we could start seeing pinpoints and so that we were able to um get on to polaris and whoops that's the same picture my apologies let me go the other way and that's just another picture of the same we're almost ready it's getting a little darker so what i want to show here was basically just i think there's only one two three four five six or seven pictures of these at the um the uh results these guys got very first time doing this kind of photography and uh and a lot of them were just they didn't know how to do the settings so here is one by uh claude Edmund, and his star trail turned out absolutely wonderful he went home and used that same um the same um software that we talked about that star stacks and this was his first kick at the can and he was so proud of that and, and rightfully so. This one was by Ian McLean. Ian McLean uh, decided he wanted to do the comet trail look. So he went and he put the, the comet uh, when you, on the star stacks. You can have it look like comet heads. So that's what he chose to do with his. So uh, so you get those little uh, little heads at the end of each one of the streaks, which gives it kind of a comet effect. But anyway, his first attempt at it. Uh, that was my, my shot at it. This was that beach that we got the auroras from. And anyway, what a beautiful spot. I could I. I had not seen it like this, so it was quite fantastic, really. Uh, a 15 second shot of the Milky Way as I was walking out of there. So everybody had left and I looked up and said, crap, there's the Milky Way. I'm not leaving those to get a Milky Way shot. So I just put it up across the street. This is actually facing that rifle range, Chris, that's right across the street. Yep. And they used to do that stuff. Yeah. And um, anyway, in the teapot, it's right there. It's given off its steam. The teapot's there, and the whole works. So you know what? For 15 seconds, I can do that. So that's what I did. 15 second shot. Uh, this was uh, Sarah O'Keefe's a crack at it. Somebody had stuck a, a big uh, dead tree in the sand and stood it up, so it looked like an old tree that was up there. This was some kids playing earlier in the day, and so she thought, what a great prop. Let's put that in there too. So it's right here. It's it's dark. Didn't have, didn't quite get it lit up, but that's that's it right there. And uh, she was so enthused with this. She said, "I'm going to instead of brighten mine up, I'm going to turn it down because I think what I'm seeing are car are star colors." And I was really impressed with that because we hadn't talked about that. But if you look at her image versus the rest of them, the reds, the oranges, the whites, the blues, they just stand right out because that's what she wanted to get out of it. So she actually got really nice star colors out of her trails. So you know what? That's that's pretty awesome. And this is done by Whalen Simpson. He did star trails. He just oriented his camera uh, in portrait mode because he wanted to get a taller look at what was going on. And and I think it's a very cool look what he ended up doing with his trail. Uh, and then he's and then he was listening to me talk to somebody else about 
you know, once you're done this, all you got to do is just one adjustment on your camera, then you can take a Milky Way. So sure enough, he took a Milky Way. <laughs> and there's his Milky Way, first time ever uh, with his camera out on the beach. So um, that's what I want to show uh, for the folks that are out there who watch our program when we had the talk on the Star Trails. Go back to that episode. And over the summer, just go out there and just you can use that, those um, techniques that we put up on there. And you can get this exact same thing that all these folks who had never done Astro before uh, and get those results. And it'd be nice if you do that to share them with Chris so that when we come back, then we can say, OK, so what did you guys do over the summer? And if you can do some of those, those star trails or Milky Way shots, um, it would be really, really nice to see them when we come back. So that's anyway, cool. that's what I want to show that for. Awesome. OK, thanks, Paul. All okay, right. can you guys just talk for a second here about uh, maybe the star trails? Give me a second, just to grab some notes. Somebody's asking, what camera are you using, Paul? Um, I have several, um, but the one I used that night was uh, uh, a Canon R6, so it's a mirrorless camera. Right on. You can do it with a DSLR. You can do. In fact, you can do star trails with a cell phone. Um, yeah. you know, they have a time lapse uh, capability built in. If you don't, you can download a time lapse app. And then you're able to do it with your cell phone. You can go online and see how that's done. It's really quite simple. Like I said, I've never taken a Star Trail picture before. And then after you did your uh, talk on it there that week, I went out and I took one in the backyard and it just blew me away how easy it was, like you say. Well, the nice thing about it is, is once you do that, then you can start getting creative in your mind. What would that what would a cool foreground be with that Star Trail? Exactly. So I go looking for these, you know, maybe this old abandoned cars out in the field or something and take a little flashlight and do a little late painting while you're taking them. And that's neat stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just it's just fun. And it's so simple, you know, and it's free again. It's free. And it's free. Yeah. <laughs> All of it, actually. <laughs> OK, um, let's go over there from there then to maybe uh, Rosanna's fun fact. Congratulations right. to everybody who took those pictures. That's that is a great spot, really, to, to get out and. Uh, Oh, it's a gorgeous spot. Oh, man. Did you guys ever get down around to the other beach? Yes. No. I've, I've been do. down there, yeah. Oh, Makes man. Sense. It's amazing down there. It's like... <laughs> it doesn't have a six-foot drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you got to watch for that. But uh, but the, it's sand, like this real sandy beach right out. So you can get right on the beach and plunk your gear down. And, oh, man, it's just beautiful there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so... All right, where is uh, Rosanna, Rosanna? Uh, give me a second, I had it all up there and I ended up doing this one. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's wrong one. <laughs> that's great oh, one, just wrong time. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna share my screen again and let's share the screen. And this is this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey. Welcome back, Rosanna, for the last time for the summer. So thank you very much. And by the way, I missed seeing Rosanna down on the beach with you guys and Karim and uh, the other night. So uh, so I, I I was just so burned. I anyway, it was a busy week. I didn't get, I just couldn't get there. Okay, so let's get into this fun fact. So Rosanna writes, hi, Paul, does does the seemingly endless amount of space acronyms drive anyone else a little bit bonkers or just me? The word acronym is actually a relatively new word arriving in 1940 and made uh, from two old Greek words, acros, meaning topmost, and, uh, and onum, onoma, actually, meaning name or word. However, acronym with a K has been in the German language since 1920, so likely uh, North Americans borrowed it. According to uh, lexic <laughs> lexicographer, lex lexico, I can't say the word, a fellow named Corey Stamper, <laughs> English has been borrowing words from other, other languages since its infancy. As many as 350 other languages are represented uh, and their linguistic contributions actually make up 80% of English. Interesting. If we start thinking about text abbreviations and acronyms, so for example, TTYL, talk to you later, truly our modern world is inundated with these initialisms. What's the difference between initialism and an acronym? NASA, 
is an acronym because we pronounce it, whereas USA is an initialism because we say the letters U, S, A, not USA. <laughs> okay. So have fun with the next part, Paul. I apologize in advance. Okay, here we go. You think we're going to tongue twist it before. Um, first here is a picture of what is coming next. So according to the TKP, China says Russia, Pakistan, and the United Arab Emirates and the uh, APSCO have signed agreements to engage in the ILRS, pictured above, more than 10 other countries and organizations are currently in negotiations, including Malaysia, according to the KLCP. China announced in April it was establishing the ILRSCO to manage the project, according to the DSEL, under the CNSA. <laughs> the aim is to finish signing agreements, memorandums, and undersigning by October. The organization's headquarters will be located in the DSSC in Hafei in Ori province. Whew. Did everybody get that? No, there's not going to be any test. <laughs> Actually, in spite of the insane amount of acronyms, this moon-based initiative is really exciting. The ILRS, or the International Lunar Research Station, base will be built in 2030s uh, through five planned missions. It seems pretty much every country and organization wants to be part of this. The early bird gets the worm though, quote, first signatories will enjoy more favorable terms and more rights as founding members, according to the DSEL. Now, the DSEL is Deep Space Exploration Laboratory, which is found which was founded in 2022 and acts as a contractor, or sorry, as a contractor for the ILRS. If you did not find the acronyms confusing, then take a look at this pic, this pic of China's concept, concept for its uh, Quayaco Communications Navigation Remote Sensing Constellation for Lunar, but most uh, also Mars and Venus exploration with orbiters, relay stations, and GEO uh, assets and EML1, EML2, use of uh, BIDO, separate crude landing and ILRS areas. It's confusing because this is actually written in uh, Chinese. So if there are people who can read that, you are very fortunate. As I examined each acronym, my favorite was probably the DSSC, which means the Deep Space Science City. Their center's focusing on the design simulation, operation control, data processing, sample storage and research and international training will be created. The centers will be named after Chinese names for the planets of the solar system. Oh no, a sec here. But yes, I have to go there, just the inner planets of the solar system in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so this one here is called <clears throat> Sui Zing, combining water and star, which is Mercury. This one is Tinsing, combining gold and star. And Thursday night, I must say, was the first time I saw Venus in the first quarter phase, and it did indeed shimmer like gold. Thank you, Chris. And D Cho. Uh, interestingly, this planet is translated to Earth and Sphere. Of course, it's our Earth. And the next one. Uh, is uh, Horshin, uh, uh, no, Ho, yeah, Horshin, which means fire and star. Yeah, so that one there, of course, meaning Mars. And of course, it's fire and star because it's, of course, orange color to look at. So over the summer, uh, so over the summer break, I hope all of you get to enjoy some spectacular night views. So, whoops, did I put that one in or did I forget it? Hang on. Oh no, I think I might have forgot that one. Really? Darn. Okay, so anyway, we'll, we'll look at this one. So over the summer break, I hope you all get to enjoy some spectacular night views. TTYITF, which means talk to you in the fall. Let's explore our digital options. CRM, SEO, RSS, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> and that wow. is this week's Rose.
Rosanna's fun fact. Rosanna. And That's fun, awesome. It was, and she gave me some good tongue twisting. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms. <laughs> oh, man. She has completely right those so many acronyms up there. Like, I work with Bell and we just use them all the time for everything. It's just... Oh my gosh, she is so intelligent and the stuff that she comes up with. Yeah. Crazy, eh? Unbelievable. I really every time I read it, I gotta read it again because not because I don't understand it, because it's just so interesting. It's like I gotta read that again because I know I'm missing something. <laughs> Did she put the translations in for you? So you can't. No, no, exactly how I'm reading it is exactly how I'm reading it. I have to read it before I come on online because otherwise I'll uh, I'll look worse than I really am. <laughs> Thank you, Rosanna, for another great talk. Uh, Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Segment. Yes. They've been a lot of fun. We're learning an awful lot from those for, for sure. Indeed. Okay, let's get to some photos then. Um, give me a minute here. I'll get things up and running. And I gotta get my notes going. Here's my notes. Okay. And I'll bring it up on the screen first of all. See where it goes. Go over this one. That's not the screen I want. This one. Okay. Now I can share my screen. <laughs> okay. All right. Easy now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. Beautiful shot from Brad Perry. Uh, Brad says here's a couple of uh, captures from this week. Uh, the first is of the Milky Way taken at Mactaquack on June the 21st around 1 a.m. He said having uh, calm water that night was an added bonus. That's hard to believe you're getting that from Mactaquack. Yeah, I know. Hard to believe you had a clear night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a beautiful shot. Yeah. yeah. Amazing for, for Mactaquack area. And then you got this one. Um the second one is of a crescent moon setting the following evening around midnight in Fredericton. He said the, the few uh, brief few days of clear weather was a welcome change of pace from the way this month has been going for sure, Brad. Beautiful. You can even see on the lights on the bridge how, how misty it still is. Yeah. Amazing nice shot. Yeah. yeah, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Really nice shot. Oh, great. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Matthew Dupre sent this one in. He said, hey, Chris, here's my submission for the show. Uh, part of the North American Nebula, and this, the Cygnus Wall. It's about an hour and 20 minutes of total exposure. That's about all I could get due to the sky conditions being low and before the clouds moved in. I was taken with my Celestron Edge HD with Hyperstar and a modified Canon T3 camera. Well done. Nice. Matthew. Well done. Very well done. Very nice. Yeah. Good job. Excellent. Thanks for that. Okay, we're going to go from there to uh, some shots of the crescent moon the other day. So Irene Doyle sent this one in, Fly Me to the Moon, I guess. <laughs> I love it. Nice shot. Well done, Irene. Jonathan Excellent. Wilson Seagull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got this one from uh, Marianne uh, McKinnon Gillette of Venus and their crescent moon together. Nice shot. And, and Carol Bean sent this one in of... Uh, We've got, uh, hang on a second, get back in my notes here. Uh, from Wednesday, the crescent moon with some Earth shine. Uh, yes. Venus and Mars, barely visible. Mars, barely visible, of course, yes. And at 10 p.m. the other evening, taken from St. Stephen. So Mars, very visible there. Yep. Well done. Well done, though. Thanks, Carol. Uh, I'm going to move from there to Bridget Day Gardner's uh, capture from Macado on Wednesday evening. So there's another capture of yes, sir. Mary, Venus, Mars. Well done. Thank you, Bridget. And we've got a couple of captures here from Brian Hazen. This one was taken on Wednesday night and then again on Thursday night. So you can see the movement there. Yes, sir. Nice Moves quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And from there, uh, we got uh, Yvonne Rudger's uh, picture from Woodstock area. Uh, she's always very lucky to capture this shot of the sun setting on Wednesday. The smoke in the air gave it a beautiful orange color. You can see the multiple sun spots as well. Isn't that crazy? The sun spots you can see. I yeah. Know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Um, well done, Yvonne. Thanks for that. Very nice shot. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go from there to uh, this one from Mr. Gadette. Um, test of the moon tonight. You said June 23rd, uh, ASI air setup and ASI 174 millimeter Celestron Nexstar 6SE scope. I think Shark Cap could have done better if the frames rates were slow, but 
they're taking over the top of the house, roof of the house. Well, that's that's another problem. <laughs> uh, you always get that heat around 845. Still light outside. He said that my scope wasn't cooled down, but still. It's still a nice fast. shot. Still nice results. No, that's right. That's great good. detail on there. You can't get yeah. much better than that. Yeah. No, it looks really good. Oh, you did a really good job. Good job, Robert. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go from there to uh, a couple of shots from Kathy Adams. Yes, sir. So I could not see the moon while standing outside as was behind the trees, but I could see it very briefly through the dining room window. So I stuck my scope out the window. And got one shot. <laughs> what astronomers do to get a there shot. <laughs> uh, well, I was using, well, I was using the bathroom. I would decide. <laughs> <laughs> That's facing south. <laughs> <laughs> Two moons that night. <laughs> 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 um, but I was glad to see it just as well as that deal. I'd say it's a pretty good image. Yeah, yeah. nice image. Very nice. And here's two nights in a row. She said, amazing. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I love those so two nights in a row from the from the bathroom, or is it two nights in a row? From the <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> not that I want to know. It's not that kind of show. <laughs> There'll be an acronym for that somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> We'll figure one out over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Kathy. All right. Yeah, great shot. Uh, David Hoskins shot here of a Comet C20 Comet, yeah. E1 Atlas, eh? Magnitude 9.7. Yes, it's sir. visible oh. all night now as, it, as it's a circumpolar. This image that I captured Tuesday night says shows a bright nucleus, large coma, and maybe just a hint of a trail, a tail. Uh, at present, uh, the comet is about 103 million kilometers from Earth. Wow. Well done. Was away. Nice yeah, shot. Absolutely. Mm. And I think where am I going from there? I'm going to go to his shot here of uh, an image of Mars, Venus, and the crescent moon forming a nice triangle just after sunset. So there we are. There it is. Plus the triangle there. Beautiful. Nice, nice well, sky that. too, eh? That's yeah, a beautiful sky. Yeah. Very nice, David. Okay, we're going to go from there uh, back to um, this one here from Stefan Picard. Stefan yes. says. Uh, both veils from the other night, uh, T1i on a new Sigma 75 to 300 millimeter lens set at 200 millimeter, uh, 400 subs at six seconds each, f5.0 ISO 3200. Stacked in DSS, the first set of editing in serial, then Photoshop, and then finally Lightroom. So this is an exploded, this is a supernova remnant. Mm, nice capture. Nice yeah. capture. Oh, there's the witch's yeah. broom. We call the witch's broom here in the, that uh, central star there. Yeah, that's, that's a big target too. Right? Yeah, big that's target. the eastern right across is the western. Yeah. And then in between, he's got some remnants of uh, Pickering's Triangle in there too. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a big complex. So uh, that's huge. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, nice, nice capture. Nice done. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. I'm going to go from there. David Smart's uh, capture of the sun uh, the other day. You know, he said in the small ioptron uh, scope. Well done, though. Lots of sunspots. Oh, man, the spots are crazy. Unbelievable. Today was just nuts. Hey, David, and uh, we're going to go from here there to uh, back to Robert Cadet's Captures of the Sun. Always nice shots. Always yeah. nice shots. Look at that prominence on the one side there. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just amazing. I mean, just you can you can see those. Uh, yeah. You don't like this. An interesting, interesting thing about this type of imagery is that you can also see this naked eye with like not naked eye, but when you're looking through a telescope, you can see it, you know, right. uh, where you can't see these things when you're looking at deep sky objects. Right. You got to collect all the data first. So yeah. that's the nice things about these things being so bright is you can actually view these things too. So. Right. Yeah. You're getting some amazing sun, sun stuff for sure. Yeah. Sun stuff looks pretty good. I'll go from there to uh, David Hoskins shot again here of the sun. Yes, sir. That's nice detail. Great. Wow. Really, it's really fine detail. That's wow. just peppered like crazy. We're, yeah. we're not even in the solar maximum yet, but look at the spots. Yeah. I think I counted yeah. 15 spots on the sun today. That's unbelievable. <laughs> look at this, yeah. There's two. Yeah, uh, two them. <laughs> wow. Like new, 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 new. <laughs> you see how they're all getting closer to the center? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're, they're coming, the coming together. Maximum. Yeah. They say maximum is still supposed to be, I think, end of 2025, so we still get a couple of years. Oh, yeah. It's a pretty active cycle, I'd say. Yeah. Oh, keep it coming. Up. up. 
yeah, Mr. Mr. Mike Powell's captured. Well, it was yesterday. Yeah. I, I caught a moment <laughs> between the clouds yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Lots of nice people. So much fun when there's that much activity, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, it's, it never gets old. That oh. was solo shot. Yeah, I like this uh, Earth and Jupiter. Yeah. Know, it's, you know, it's an indication of what's where. And that gives me uh, an idea how to orient the photo, too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nicely done. Mr. Owen, you, you, you beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Florida Beach. Anybody who lives local, uh, yeah. I think we found a, well, actually, a, a, Tom Rathby actually found this a long time ago. Yeah. But um, he's done some amazing, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, Aurora. Um, oh, good God. What do you call it when you look at a video and slow it down or speed it up? Time lapse. Time lapse. Time lapse. Thank you. And yeah, he, this is where he does it from. And I can see why now because it's such yeah. a place. It really is. Yeah. I used to fish there. I never knew it was called Florida Beach. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know anything until Chris mentioned it the night that Chris said he got stranded out there. Yeah. It's yeah. the first time I ever heard of it. Yeah. Thought he was in Florida, though. That's Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, gonna, yeah. That's a long, it's a long walk home. The walk from there, the walk from there fellow goes from Florida for sure. <laughs> All right, and, the, and here's your Milky Way one that you had to give away too, see? So there you go. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the prancing pony there. You know what? The skies are, are really dark there. I was really surprised yeah. how much you could see naked yeah. eye, like Milky Way stuff. Yeah. Well, you're facing okay. away from the city glow too, in that perspective. Yeah. It's real yeah, nice. Absolutely. You don't have to be that far out of the city to get this for sure. True. Oh, you know what? I'm going to be spending some time out there this summer because it is a really nice spot. It's a beautiful place. spot. Yeah. All right, and then from there, I'm going to start go getting through. crowded now, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It'd be a popular spot. Yeah. Um, of course, we were lucky enough, uh, uh, Corinne. Oh, yeah. I missed that. And family yeah. uh, down at the beach the other night. Uh, uh, I met Corinne back in 2019 when I went to Rask, uh, Canada for the national, uh, national, uh, for the national whatever event. <laughs> Kulak, the Kulak. And, yes, I got the Kulak Award. That's right. Yeah. Um, the outreach award. Um, anyway, I met Corinne up up there, and he was, uh, you know, super nice, and you know, come right up, and introduce himself right away, and we talked a lot about outreach, and, and he's uh, he's heavily involved in it himself to Rask, and he's also a professor at John Abbott College in, in, uh, in professor of astronomy in John John Abbott College in Montreal. So anyway, he we've always talked about him coming by, you know, if you ever get down this way to, to stop by the beach, and we show him where where we set up. So sure enough, he did make it down this week. So it was great, great to see him and great to see the family. And, that's and awesome. So that's, dropped his, uh, that's his two daughters and his wife holding the phone doing the selfie. Yeah, yeah. So and, then, and let everybody else to know, know who's there. I think a lot of them have been on the show. Yeah, they have. Yeah, Mike Thorne there. Yeah, Robert, Thorne. So we got Mike Thorne, we got uh, Robert Cadet, Rob Carson, and yeah. uh, uh, Stefan. Stefan Picard, and Rosanna. There's Rosanna. Yeah, yeah. 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 And Kurt Nason. So yes, I was very, very pleased and thankful for everybody that dropped out to to uh, to uh, help say hello to Karim and and, and the gang. So it was, it was a great night. Uh, he stayed till one, well, eleven thirty or so. They had a good night for it too. It was just night for two yeah, yeah. 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 So they opened up really nicely, so we got to see a lot of nice treasures from the telescope. So yeah. anyway, he's safe travels on his way home. I think now. Um, so that's great. Yeah, that must have been a fun night, hey. Eh? It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was just it was almost like the you know the uh, the mini uh, star party we had down there that night. Oh, when uh, uh, Jenna was down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's it's still difficult to get everybody together because I mean everybody still has the COVID fear a little bit. I think you know uh, it's it's coming back, but it's coming back slowly. Outreach, you know, it's yeah. uh, not where not where it was before for sure. But hopefully things will improve. Anyway, and I got another thing to to talk about here uh, just for a few minutes. We have a member in our club uh, that has received a, a special award emma mcphee yes oh. yeah so it came out in the it actually came out in the rask uh, report of the 2022 annual report and i was reading it the other day and i said well look at this now there's a service a service award so emma received a, a service award now emma's been a member of rask nb since 2001 uh, shortly after it was established originally as a rask moncton center uh, since joining she has been an important dedicated hardworking, and integral part of the center for sure I'm done. Sure. <laughs> That's um, good for her. Good for she her, has been absolutely. a council member since 2003, um, holding numerous positions on the council, including secretary, 
from 2003 to 2006, newsletter editor 2007, treasurer 2007 to 2010, treasurer and general committee member for the NB Center GA AGM in 2010, counselor in 2011, second VP in 2012, treasurer in 2012, <laughs> treasurer 2013, the president, <laughs> uh, national observing uh, committee member, uh, currently Rask NB uh, observing chair, at present uh, secretary treasurer 2020 to present, a frequent speaker at meetings, outreach, um, at about 100 events since 2016. Mostly uh, courses for seniors, too. Uh, guides, public observing at Moncton uh, High School observing. Mad Science Camp, she calls it, summer camp. Uh, now, prior to 2016, participated in numerous of, uh, other observing events held by RASC uh, NB annually, like star parties and special events. She's earned her certificates for Explore the Universe, Messier, and Finest NGC programs. And now she's working on the Double Star and the Lunar program certificates. Now, Emma has contributed in many ways to the growth and well-being of our center. She has been supportive of and involved in center and member initiatives, projects, and events. She was part of the Committee for the Application for Charitable Status from 2019 to 2022. And then uh, Emma has actually helped uh, mentor new members in their observing, as well as recruiting new members to the center. She's also been involved in planning for the future of Rask NB. Very busy girl. Um, over the years, Emma has demonstrated her commitment and dedication to Rask NB in small, quiet, unsung ways, uh, supporting new members in their efforts, offering ideas for future plans, events, problem solving, observing, etc. And she's contributed much to Rask NB, who are proud to nominate her for the well-deserved Rask Service Award. Emma, all of us here at Sunday Night Astronomy Show, too, would like to wish you congratulations on receiving your special award. Thank you for all you do for Rask NB. Absolutely. Well-deserved. Congratulations, Emma. Yes. And that's going to be our photo session for tonight. No, son. <laughs> no, son. <laughs> that's awesome for emma that's fantastic yeah that's well awesome. deserved well deserved she's for been, sure it's been so dedicated oh yeah a lot of years yeah, yeah. yeah. i wish she was on her her. <laughs> her. Tune in later on and watch the program so anyway yeah. well deserved yeah okay so i guess we're going to get into our closing tonight um a little bit different for me, I guess. So, so in closing tonight, this is a bit different closing statement than I would normally make. As mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, we will be taking a summer break after 184 episodes of our program. Uh, it takes a lot of effort each week to bring you the show. And I want to, first of all, thank those who have been here supporting us right along, especially Rosanna for providing us with so many interesting fun facts. Uh, Rosanna has been with us really since the beginning of the program, and we truly appreciate all of the effort that she's put in into all of our segments to help keep, keep us informed on current topics. Thank you, Rosanna. Very much so. Absolutely. Um, a special thanks too goes out to Trudy, who has continuously chaired our program with so many other social media pages and, and really helped spread the word of our offering here. Thank you, Trudy, and the NB Storm and Weather Center and all of those who have shared it as well. It's uh, Trudy Allman. Yeah. Um, and Sean Connor. And, uh, very yes. Yeah. Um, also to... Uh, to Kurt Nason, who's joined us monthly on, on here to share his wonderful stories about the constellations and the wonderful treasures that they contain. Uh, thank you, Kurt. So uh, much knowledge. <laughs> so <laughs> much knowledge. I'd also like to thank Joel and our friends over at Rogers, uh, who have graciously offered to rebroadcast our episodes almost 20 times per week uh, throughout the province. Uh, thank you, Joel. And of course, we'd like to thank each and every one of you as well, who have uh, continued to support our efforts at bringing you something fun and interesting each week. Lastly, but most important, um, I'd like to extend special thanks to these two guys who have made this much easier for an introvert like me to help reach all of you. I would never have been able to believe that I could have ever hosted a program like this. And you guys have made it uh, fun and memorable on more than one occasion. <laughs> well, it's not over, it's just a hiatus. <laughs> so I'm gonna thank you. Uh, now this program was initially offered to provide you with live views of the night sky treasures with yeah. mountain time weather. <laughs> that went over well. <laughs> I think we've become the treasures. <laughs> <laughs> we, we quickly learned that our plans had to change. Indeed, in the 184 episodes, we only had three clear Sunday nights. Uh, and two of, those were in, two of those were in the summer months when we couldn't offer anything anyway. Yeah. Still the broadcast was very crazy in New Brunswick. <laughs> 
still the broadcast was meant to fill in the gaps between those long winter nights until we could meet again in person at outreach events. Um, and we do hope that uh, we have achieved those goals and we have uh, hope that we have been able to keep you edutained along the way. <laughs> Be assured that we are not going anywhere though. We are not giving up on the broadcast. We are just taking a break while we invest more time in showing you the treasures at the eyepiece, uh, whether at one of our many public events, as I mentioned here tonight, or at my favorite local spot to share in the night sky with all of you here in St. John at St. Rest Beach uh, at near the gates of the Urban Nature Park. If you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can also still find me at, on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, where I will continue to post regularly. And you can find more about the night sky at astronomybythebay.ca as well, which leads you to the St. John Astronomy Club uh, website, which has tons of information on there. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and myself, until we meet again in mid-September, uh, we wish you a safe and wonderful summer. Lots of clear skies, everybody. As we like to say, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Open it up. Yep. Good night, everyone, and we'll see you. Have, have a good summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.